Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming here today. Uh, my name is Jared Overson, and I'm going to be talking about credential stuffing. Uh, and uh, I know as security professionals or people who at least care about security, a lot of us have a tendency uh, to kind of brush off credential stuffing because to us, it's it's an easily solvable problem for us not to be affected. We just don't reuse our passwords and ideally enable multi-factor authentication wherever possible. Uh, so the, the point of this talk is to, is to hopefully describe to you the depth of the problem uh, and, and show why it is a massive problem and uh, why it's also a really fun problem, tackle, uh, fun problem to tackle uh, because of how sophisticated the attackers are. So for anyone who needs a refresher, Credential stuffing is the replay of breached username and uh, credential pairs across many sites in order to find out who is reusing passwords. Pretty simple, right? Uh, it's a four-step process. You got to get credentials. You've got to automate the login because you're not going to sit there and type in all those credentials by hand. Uh, you need to defeat whatever automation defenses already exist. And there is inevitably something that you need to defeat. Uh, and they need to distribute globally. So the numbers... Uh, I have to present to you a hopefully illustrate why this is an exploding problem. Credential stuffing is fueled by spills of credentials, credential spills. Uh, the company that I work at, Shape Security, publishes a report every year, the Credential Spill Report, uh, where we track a lot of these things and, and uh, try to gather information about them. Last year in 2018, we recorded over 1 billion credentials spilled on the public or dark web. Uh, that is a lot of credentials to fuel credential stuffing. Um, we also recorded our largest day of attacks ever at 2 billion plus attacks. And then we also, in January of this year, recorded our largest attack campaign ever at 3 billion attacks against one URL in one week. So, uh, thank you. We're going to go into uh, three things here. We're going to go into uh, an attack detail, uh, so describing how what these attacks actually occur, how much they actually cost. If you wanted to put on your black hat tonight, maybe you're pissed at your boss and you want to go home and be an attacker, uh, you can go home and with the money in your pocket, get started tonight. Then we're going to go over how credential stuffing has evolved, the state of it now, and then where account takeovers in general are evolving to. So before I get started on the uh, actual detail and cost, uh, I need to differentiate manual work and automation. Any attack out there steps between manual work and automation frequently. There's never an attack that you can just walk up to blindfolded, smash a button, and have millions and millions of dollars pouring all over you. Those just don't exist. That would be an example of a 100% you know, automated attack, and those just don't really exist. You can come close, uh, but it's not quite that the, uh, at that point. So automation could be anything from a port scan uh, or, or searching Google or, or automating a browser or anything like that. Stuff that allows you to do the boring and low value stuff uh, trivially over and over and over and over again. You're not going to sit there and scan through 65,000 ports by hand because most of them will just not amount to much. So you need to automate that stuff in, in order for attacks to be uh, economically viable. And that's where manual work and automation come into play. So manual work is the stuff that you do when the value is there. Automation is what you have to resort to when the value is not there. The stuff I'm going to be talking about this entire presentation and in general is all hinging around cost versus value. If the value is there, the cost of these attacks can be adjusted in order to make them, uh, in order to make them continue. So if there are no defenses in place, cost is virtually zero. You can use existing strategies, existing tools, existing tactics. Uh, you can almost press a button and have more money pouring all over you uh, because a lot of the problems have already been solved. This is the same thing with, with technology in general. Uh, things that might be new at the start becomes easier as more people un understand them. As you add any defenses in place, you force a generational shift for these attacks. Now, it could be something homegrown, it could be a vendor, it could be anything else. No matter what you put in place, it's going to stop virtually every single one of your attackers, if only for a little bit, because you've just changed what's going on. And uh, this is what you want to do over and over and over again until you get to the point where you tip the cost versus value justification in your favor. This is where you need to be with defenses. This is, this is what we're doing with the firewalls, application DDoS stuff, captures, whatever else. We're trying to add layers and layers of defenses on it until it just no longer makes sense to attack us anymore. 
The problem there is that the same thing with uh, computing, uh, mobile phones, uh, machine learning, uh, storage space, whatever else, is that over time, the cost of entry into all these technologies just reduces naturally. Same thing I was talking about before. People understand it better. Uh, the tools become cheaper. Uh, the hardware becomes optimized for these use cases. It just becomes naturally cheaper over time. And you couple that with the fact that uh, every single one of our responsibilities is to grow value in our company, and we have this dynamic pulling far, far away from where we want to, where we want to be. We have always cost of the attacks reducing and the value of successful attacks increasing. This is fueling rapid and rapid iteration. So, how much does it cost to actually issue a credential stuffing attack? Uh, first, you gotta get credentials. Uh, this is one of those things that used to actually be somewhat costly. You needed to run in the right groups, you needed to know the right people, you needed to purchase these credentials, you needed to breach the data yourself. Now you can go to a site like raidforums.com and download nearly a terabyte of credentials for uh, eight credits. Eight credits is about $2.50, which is more than I had on the account at this point in time. Uh, but it, all it was doing was hiding a torrent link, so you could just go on any other post that had that torrent link and grab that for free. So this is uh, this was the post that announced uh, collections one, two, three, four, five, and the anti-public mega leak. Uh, we might have heard of cr uh, collection one. Uh, Troy Hunt wrote about that. And whenever he writes about something like that, everyone knows about it. Um, which strange though, everyone knows about collection one, uh, but the the other nine hundred gigabytes of data that was announced like a week or two later, it's like eh. We already heard about collection one. It's no big deal. This is a monstrous number of credentials uh, that includes dumps of upwards of 10 years ago. Basically, every breach that we've heard about is in a dump like this. So you can get started with all the credentials that have been spilled in uh, for virtually nothing. Well, actually, for literally nothing. And uh, this amounted to, I think it was about uh, upwards of 20 billion credential pairs. I think it actually amounted to about 2.3 billion unique credentials. Uh, but still, that's 2.3 billion usernames and passwords to start with. Next up is to automate the login, because we're certainly not going to be sitting through and typing in 2.3 billion email addresses and passwords by hand. Uh, it's, it's just not, it's not the success rate is not high enough to make that worthwhile. So we use a tool like this. This is a browser automation studio. Uh, this is uh, one of the more advanced automation tools. Uh, I generally consider the automation tools to exist in kind of two camps, uh, there are for at least for web automation. There are tools that automate sites you own and tools that automate sites you don't. Uh, tools that automate sites you don't, I generally classify as attack tools. Tools that automate sites you own are testing, QA, developer tools, things like that. Uh, this tool uh, includes things like uh, uh, integrations for capture solvers, switching fingerprints, uh, rotating through proxies, stuff like that. I would place this squarely in the attack tool category, despite the fact that it is a general purpose tool that you can use for anything, and it is very, very cool and advanced. You can see on the left-hand side, it actually has a visual uh, logic organizer so that you can uh, basically drag and drop your way to a fully automated website very easily. And uh, if you weren't so inclined to actually do that yourself, you could go to a site like upwork.com and just pay somebody else to do it for you. There are people who sell their surface services uh, configuring tools like this for, uh, this one's $10 an hour. Uh, and I would, I would guess that you could probably configure uh, average low defense sites uh, in about three to five hours. So it's about, about $30, $50 for uh, somebody to develop this for you. And for other tools, you can find pre-configured uh, configurations that you can purchase for about the same price. Next up, you want to defeat whatever existing defenses there are. Uh, and there is always something in your way. You've probably seen something like this. Uh, this is Google's reCAPTCHA version two. Version one was the squiggly letters and the numbers uh, where they claim that you are transcribing books or something like that. Uh, this one will give you the swirly swirl and the green check mark if you uh, look okay. If you don't look okay, then Google will have you help train its machine learning algorithms to find out what a crosswalk is or a street sign or something like that. And if you do a good enough job there, then it'll think that you're okay and it'll, it'll allow you to go through. Now, a defense like this is actually, does, they do a really, really good job at identifying sketchy behavior. 
The problem is though, is that everyone uses this and it's free and it's everywhere. Now, if you were an attacker or a burglar or something like that, and you were presented with one neighborhood that all had uh, really, really great locks, all had individually awesome locks, uh, and then you had another neighbor neighborhood that all had the same really, really good lock, which lock would you target penetrating first? The one that got you an entire neighborhood, right? This is what incentivizes uh, developers and, and people in the ecosystem to build tools to bypass common defenses. This is death by CAPTCHA. This is one of dozens of CAPTCHA solvers that exist. Uh, there are actually so many CAPTCHA solvers that if you Google CAPTCHA solver, Google will propagate the top 10 CAPTCHA solvers to its answer box because there's just so much information written about them. So you don't even have to be some sort of shady attacker to do this. You can Google your way to an attack tonight. So this is uh, a buck 39, a dollar 39 for 1,000 solved CAPTCHAs. Not even CAPTCHA attempts, this is just 1,000 solved CAPTCHAs. And it's 99 cents if you're a gold member. So if you do this a lot, you should probably consider upgrading. Uh, <laughs> but it, uh, it includes libraries for Ruby, uh, Python, Java, Node, PHP, whatever else. You can hook this up, slap in an API key, and you've got CAPTCHA solved. It's not a, it's not a complicated problem anymore. Uh, but if that's uh, too expensive, you can use something like this, which is a tool that has a free version that allows you to solve CAPTCHAs locally, not even delegating to an API or anything like that. Uh, the success rate is a little bit lower, uh, but again, it's, it, this is a cost versus value play. Issuing traffic, sending traffic is actually really, really cheap. So even if you have a success rate as low as 50%, all you need to do is just double the requests you're sending and you get the output you're looking for. Next up is to distribute globally. Because of one of the, the early defenses we had in place, IP rate limiting, if you were issuing three billion attacks from a single IP address, you would stick out like a sore thumb and you'd be knocked down very, very quickly. So you have to distribute your traffic to make it look like it's coming all across the globe. Uh, this is another thing that used to be expensive. You used to need to have to manage your own proxies. You needed to uh, get your own bots or botnet uh, that can proxy traffic all around the world. Now you can just sign up at AWS or Azure or Google, Google Cloud and get your code distributed all around the globe in perfectly scalable environments for almost literally nothing. You can spin up Google Functions and the first million invocations are free. So you, you, the ability to spin up code that looks like it's coming from all over the place is virtually uh, not an issue anymore. So the cost of uh, issuing 100,000 account takeover attempts uh, can be tried for less than 200 US dollars. So again, we cost, uh, it's zero dollars for uh, billions of credentials. Uh, it can be zero dollars if you want to configure these tools yourself, but time is money and you might as well just pay for it. Uh, so you pay 50 bucks. Uh, if you want 100,000 solved CAPTCHAs, you're going to pay paying $139 for death by CAPTCHA or $99 if you're a gold member. Um, and you can get global IP addresses for nothing, but you can spend a few bucks uh, to tailor your demographics and get higher quality, higher reputation IP addresses very, very easily. So that is less than two tenths of a US penny uh, for each individual account takeover attempt. Now, the cost is irrelevant unless we understand the value. So the rate of return is calculated by uh, the, the value of our goal uh, multiplied by the chance of success divided by the cost subtracting our initial investment, you get our rate of return. So for a cost of two tenths of a penny, a success rate of what we've seen between 0.2 and 2% uh, for credential stuffing attacks and a, a range of values between what I've seen between two dollars and several hundred dollars. Uh, value is, is generally lower for low value things like forums, a lot of musical artists, uh, forums, those, those accounts will exist. They're not going to be very valuable. They'll sell for pennies or a couple dollars. Uh, Fortnite skins, uh, will go for, for a few dollars, two tens of dollars, depending on the rarity of the skins. Uh, as sites that uh, deal with money, especially money transfer, go for a lot because that helps in money laundering. So these accounts are worth a lot and you mash all these up together and you have a rate of return at the low end of a hundred percent and at the other, at the high end, hundreds of thousands of percent. This is a phenomenal value for anyone to do and it costs so little to get started. 
this is what is fueling the, the uh, attack evolution because the value is so, so high and the uh, cost is so, so stupidly low. Uh, so next up is uh, we're going to go over how credential stuffing has evolved. Uh, so because the cost or value is so out of whack, no matter what defense you put in place, they're going to want to bypass it because the value is still there. It doesn't disappear. So at the start, uh, because it's important to just be as cheap as humanly possible, you start off with something like curl or wget. You don't need to do anything fancy. If there are no defenses in place, you just issue your post, post request, analyze the response, and determine whether or not you got a successful login or, or failed login. Then you get tools that are optimized for attacks of that nature, uh, like Sentry MBA. Sentry MBA is a relatively ancient tool uh, in, in the scope of technology. I think it was released around 2009, but it's optimized for these types of attacks specifically. Uh, it it uh, makes it easier to ingest combo lists. Combo lists are text files of uh, username and password combinations. Uh, so like a, a email address or username, uh, and then a literal colon, and then a password, and then a new line. These are optimized for ingestion by tools like this. Uh, so if you if you search for combo list, you'll find lots of information on combo lists. And if you're looking to figure out how tools are easily configured for combo lists, you can look for those sorts of configurations. So it also uh, evolved over time to get past some uh, future defenses that eventually we put into place. Like we talked about, the first defense that we really had was IP rate limiting, uh, which I'm sure everyone here uh, has been in a situation where we've had to IP rate limit or block an IP at some point in time, and we probably also remember how futile that was because of how trivial it is to get around things like that. So the, one of the first defenses, uh, one of the first attacker responses was just rotating through proxies. Uh, very, very easy to do uh, in general, even without cloud services. Um, but you'll also get to the, the point where you'll um, have uh, services like Akamai or whatever else uh, dealing with IP reputation. How, how, a legitimate, how, how consistently legitimate is traffic coming from a particular IP address? Attackers know stuff like that, so then they start proxying through legitimate residential home networks via a service like the Luminati network. Anyone ever heard of this? So this is, this is a, a service that allows you to proxy through residential home networks just like yours and mine. Now, uh, this is great for attackers and people who, who want to look like they're coming from residential uh, home networks, but why would you or I have something like this that allows other arbitrary people to proxy through our network? This is important. If you take nothing away, you should go check your home networks, especially if you have spouses or kids or roommates or anyone else in your house, uh, because this happens because of services like this. Ola VPN. This is a free VPN. Uh, doesn't even encrypt traffic. It's a pretty useless VPN. Uh, but it allows you to make it seem like your traffic is coming from another country. Now, why would anyone willingly install something like this? For services like Netflix and Amazon Prime and streaming services, things like that. Uh, content rights in different parts of the world are different. So if I want to watch Harry Potter, I can't do that in the US, but I can do that in Australia. So if I get something like this and I make it look like my traffic's coming from Australia, I can watch all of Harry Potter all I want. This is the type of thing that uh, runs rampant in uh, in like uh, uh, social groups. One person gets in on this, starts recommending it to their friends. Pretty soon, everyone has Ola VPN installed. And then when their phones or PCs are idle, uh, of course, it turns your home network into a proxy for something like the Luminati network. This is why these things are free. Again, and I'm sure we all know this in this room, if you're not paying for a service, you're being fleeced somehow. And this is how this service makes money. So one of the defenses uh, that we took, put in place, uh, and I say we in general as the industry uh, put in place next, was CAPTCHAs. The squiggly letters and numbers and lines through them and stuff like that because uh, basic tools that were just issuing uh, HTTP requests couldn't figure out what to respond here. So then we already uh, talked about this. You go through CAPTCHA solvers. Uh, before, it was better and better optical character recognition. And then as uh, CAPTCHAs got more advanced, uh, then they started farming it out to APIs, which then farmed it out to actual individual human beings, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then the, the next defense was dynamic sites and JavaScript heavy defenses. Uh, you get into recapture v2, which is certainly a great example of a JavaScript heavy defense, but there are numerous out there. 
And uh, to bypass these, you don't necessarily need to run JavaScript, but you do need something that understands the browser, understands the DOM, understand, or can, can query for values that exist in the JavaScript context uh, or, or in, in the DOM. So you get things like PhantomJS and TrifleJS, which are scriptable web views. Web views are just con development containers that, that uh, include browser components that you can embed into other things. Uh, these were early instances of tools that allowed users to test websites. These are not attack tools. These are generic purpose tools that uh, attackers use to uh, continue attacking websites. Defense we had against those was inspecting the environment or looking at the host header order. So if you notice here, the uh, host header for Chrome is always the first header that is sent. In PhantomJS, it is always the last header that is sent. So when you look for simple things like this, it starts just to expose huge swaths of traffic that you can block relatively easily. Of course, something like this is easy to bypass, but this is what the game is back and forth with, with attackers. You find something, you block on it. They bypass it, you find something, you block on it over and over and over again. Phantom, Phantom JS and other tools also expose things in the JavaScript environment. Phantom exposes the method call Phantom, which you can use to talk back to the Phantom API. You look for things like that, you pass it up to your server, or you do something on the web page, and you can block browsers that way. Again, very, very simple techniques, not very complicated. Attackers moved on and uh, started scripting consumer browsers. So they use things like Selenium and now Puppeteer in order to script uh, consumer browsers, modern stuff, the stuff that we're using. Production Chrome, production Firefox, uh, Edge, anything else. Uh, these are the same sorts of things as Phantom and Trifle, uh, but they are now scripting real browsers in order to bypass the, the oddities of using a non-standard browser. The next step there uh, is to Oh, the defense there, sorry, before I jump into, into the, the, how to bypass that defense, was browser fingerprinting. So this, this is something that's still actually uh, relatively prevalent today, um, but it's you, you grab a whole bunch of data from the browser. It could be like screen size, the plugins you have installed, the fonts you have installed, things like that. You grab enough high entry B data points, smash those together, and you essentially just rate limit on them. Same sort of concepts as IP rate limiting, but with browser metadata as opposed to uh, network level metadata. And attackers, of course, knew that. This is just recycled ad technology that used to track you all over the place, so it was well known. Uh, and they would get to, they would make tools like this. This is Fraud Fox, uh, which is the ultimate in internet privacy. All these tools talk about how they're privacy oriented, but with a name like Fraud Fox, you can probably figure out what it's, what it's intended to be used for. Uh, but uh, this and anti-detect, uh, they they make a, or they specialize in randomizing and altering those fingerprintable data points, so that if you're rate limiting off those, you're you're not going to be caught in those rate limits anymore. Um, this is also a virtual machine-based solution for defeating browser fingerprinting. Uh, so because it's VM-based, uh, once you get it configured, you can then deploy it to whatever virtualization solution you you are interested in, and you are perfectly scalable to the sky. Next defense there was then identifying negative traits from user behavior. It's very, very uh, easy to identify a bot when they look like this, when they're just incredibly quickly typing out letters uh, or smashing out entire strings in a fraction of a millisecond or always clicking at the 00xy point on elements. Things like that make it very, very easy to identify obviously non-human behavior. And in a situation like this, what we're dealing with, uh, the vast majority of non-human behavior is going to be uh, traffic that is trying to manipulate and exploit you. So you look for those, you pass them up to your server, do some sort of checks, and then you can detect uh, or you detect and block browsers that way. And of course, attackers move on from there and use a tool like I talked about before, Browser Automation Studio. Uh, can you see the cursor there? Yeah. Uh, so this is this is a tool that uh, emulates user behavior. So it, it rather than just teleporting the mouse over and over again, uh, you will see the mouse gradually go to to uh, to the points you want to click, randomize the exact points, uh, have some jitter along the way. You'll even notice uh, before it would stop in random places. You can add a configurable idle human behavior, so you can simulate things like like reaching for your coffee and hitting the mouse a little bit, or, or walking 
hacking away from com your computer for a little while. This takes time, which does increase the cost of an attack, but if that's your way through, then it's still low enough cost in order to, to offset the, that by the value. So the defense there was browser consistency checks. See this back and forth? You, you're catching, catching a, a rhythm so far? This is what we've been doing for years, and these are very, very motivated, persistent attackers who are trying to get through. So because they're randomizing data points, I uh, started to invest in the validation of these data points to make sure they're well within uh, good ranges. If you're Chrome, you better be telling us that you support Aug Vorbis. If you're Internet Explorer and you're telling us that you support Aug Vorbis, chances are you are lying about that because you don't support Aug Vorbis. So these are the types of things that uh, you can look for in order to determine how many lies the attacker is telling you. Real users don't need to lie a lot. Attackers do because they're using a handful of sources and then distributing that traffic so it looks like millions. They need to look like millions, otherwise you block them. Um, so they have to lie more. Next step there, attackers used real device fingerprints. So this is Bablosoft's fingerprint switcher, uh, which, which uh, scrapes and records and stores loads of real user uh, browser fingerprints. Now, I'm using fingerprints at this point because they're using fingerprints. Fingerprints At that, this point, it's just a collection of data that is grabbed from browsers. We've lost the fingerprint ability, really, at this point. Um, but it's still allowing you to, uh, with a browser extension or, or an, uh, an attack tool, iterate through real browser fingerprints or to further obscure the source of the traffic. So we still have some more to go, but we're going to bypass that a little bit because I think you see probably where the direction this all is heading. All of this is heading towards the emulation of real user behavior on real devices, on real home networks. So this is what we're calling uh, in our company uh, because we need to differentiate these uh, imitation attacks. Imitation attacks uh, indicate a sophisticated level of fraud, uh, advanced uh, developers, and a level of persistence that allows them to retool back and forth, trying to make their uh, traffic look uh, as legitimate as possible. Uh, not all imitation attacks have to be automated. Not all imitation attacks are uh, automation. Did I say that right? I think you probably get the gist. Um, but in general, this is where we see things going, is, is the perfect emulation of, of human behavior. And at that point, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to, to differentiate legitimate traffic and attack traffic. So where do account takeovers go from here? Now, first, I need to clear something up. Two-factor authentication does not stop credential stuffing. This is something that we hear touted a lot by Google, Microsoft. And it's not that they're necessarily saying this, but they're using words that allow people to assume this is what they're saying. Multi-factor authentication does a great job at stopping automated account takeovers, but like we were talking about earlier, there's always a back and forth between manual work and automation. Now, it's not necessarily necessary that uh, when you're automating credential stuffing, you have to automate the account takeover part. Credential stuffing alone still gives you valid accounts, and the valid accounts still have value. Now, think about the type of person who, uh, if, they're, if they're victim to a credential stuffing attack, is reusing a password, but they also have multi-factor authentication enabled. That's the type of person that knows enough to be confident, but not knows enough, but doesn't know enough to be effective. These are exactly the type of people that are very easy to fish or social engineer. Now, uh, to bypass multi-factor authentication, I'm going to go through a, a step right now and I'm dropping some really, really cool zero days on you all. Uh, I wish that would actually be cool, uh, but that's way too advanced for what we need uh, because cheap and easy is what works here. So to bypass multi-factor authentication, the easiest and cheapest way to do that uh, is to just have the target do it for you. So for me to do something like that, I already have username and password. I already know it's your username and password. I enter those in. I get ready to submit, and uh, I give you a call. I give you uh, Jan, Jan, Jan. I, I give Jan a call here, and 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 uh, he answers, and I say, Hey, Jan, I'm from uh, what Chase? Chase is a bank everyone knows. Uh, I'm noticing that uh, you have some strange, uh, strange purposes, uh, purchases from Australia. Are you in Australia right now? No, of course not. You're in Amsterdam. That's wild. Uh, so you did not just make an $8,000 purchase and a $12,000 purchase? 
No, no, of course not. And actually, this is, so this is, I'm kind of joking right now, but uh, questions like this are good because they get the person on the other end panicking. They get defensive and they say, no, of course not. I didn't make those purchases at all. It's like, okay, okay, all right, all right. Well, normally in these situations, I would tell you to make sure that you have multi-factor authentication turned on. Uh, it looks like you have that turned on here, which is good. So I've told you that uh, I know something about your account that really only the bank should know. Um, now, uh, can I send you, uh, can I send you uh, uh, a token in order to make sure that you have, uh, or that you are actually in possession of the device that has registered the account? Of course, so we'll take care of those purchases immediately. All I do is press submit, Jan gets a text message uh, with a multi-factor authentication token on that, gives it to me, and, says, uh, and then I say, it's like, all right, great, we'll take care of those purchases immediately, we'll wipe them from your record, no worries, you enjoy your day. And then you leave the phone call thinking, wow, what great customer service. I did nothing, and they eliminated $20,000 worth of purchases. But what you've done is just give an attacker the multi-factor authentication token that gives them access to your account. This is what we see because it's so easy and so cheap. Now, this is why uh, it's important to, to talk about and think about the cost versus value. Because once you have that list of valid accounts, the value of the attack from that point on dramatically raises because you don't have that wishy-washiness of, of the billions of invalid user accounts. So you can do different things to get in there. Another thing that we're seeing, and if you were here for the, uh, the cross-site scripting talk earlier, then this is very relevant there. But it's basically the, uh, the uh, Resident script or extension uh, hijacking an account after the user has gotten through. So as an example, uh, let's say this guy's logging into his bank, um, logs in. This time's taking it just a little bit longer than normal, but that's okay. We've taught web users that's perfectly okay. Uh, this time, some sort of resident script or extension or something like that has hijacked the session. So we're already logged in, and the script is making it look like it's not logged in. So we go through and the script tries to add a new payee. Perfectly fine. Works because why shouldn't it? It's an API call. We're already authenticated. No big deal. Then the script tries to transfer funds. Now at this point, uh, what could be a percentage or a flat amount, whatever is lower, no big deal. Um, at this point, what most systems should see uh, is that this, is, uh, this exceeds a risk threshold. This is shady. We just logged in, add a new payee, tried to transfer right away. That sets off some alarms. So we ask the user to enter a multi-factor authentication token. Pass that on to Barry, who is expecting this flow. It's no big deal. They enter in their token. Script grabs it, continues their transaction. Everything looks okay. And of course, everything works perfectly. Now, this might seem Hollywoody and hypothetical, uh, but I mean, we already saw that talk earlier, which talked about how these scripts get resident in your browser and stick around. Uh, this is no no different than that. Um, but we also see malicious extensions being sold and acquired very, very easily. How many of you paid for the extensions that you have in your browser? <laughs> and I know it's none of you, so don't lie. The developers behind that aren't getting any money necessarily. If somebody wants to pay them five to $10,000 to take that away, a lot of them will probably say yes, and who knows what happens to those extensions afterward. If that's not enough, as an attacker, you might as well just try to exploit a developer machine and build your code directly into the software that you want to exploit. This is a NPM's event stream exploit from last November, uh, which had malicious code uh, injected to an open source package and then downloaded by 8 million developers plus. If anyone here uses Node or NPM or VS Code or anything like that, I guarantee you that you had this code on your computer. It was just targeting specific things. You don't necessarily need to worry, but if we all think we're better than this, we're not. This is something that can easily just jump in without us knowing. So after this, what is beyond credential stuffing? Now the value in these accounts is not going away, but we are raising the cost of credential stuffing so it becomes easier for attackers to justify other, a tool, a, other tools to find these valid accounts and to exploit them. I, we're seeing a lot of diversity of attacks. Uh, this is an example of uh, the more recent malware that we've seen called Genesis. I mean, some news articles on the Genesis marketplace. Uh, this is a marketplace malware and extension combination. Uh, what it does is it infects computers, and it has uh, upwards of 125,000 right now already infected, and it scrapes accounts uh, and cookies and everything else that is happening on that uh, machine and sends it to this marketplace. 
So you can see some of these accounts, uh, these high value accounts already advertised, things like LinkedIn, Google, Facebook. These are not just trivial accounts. They're just grabbing them easily because they're in the uh, victim's computer. This particular account uh, fell victim uh, September 17th, which was what? a week and a half ago, uh, and it was updated on the 18th. Uh, I think I took these screenshots on the 18th, 19th, or 20th, so these are still very, very, very fresh. And the malware will continually uh, grab these accounts and update these records. So each infected computer and bundle of information is sold as one unit. Once you've purchased it, you are the only person who has access to that bot and its data. This allows the, you to make sure that you, you, you maintain the, uh, the quality of this infected computer and the quality of these credentials so that you don't have other people abusing it and having the, the uh, victim uh, become aware and clean their computer. You are in control of how much you let on to the, uh, to the victim. This is the bot details page. You can see that uh, it scrapes everything it possibly can. So it has 114 known resources. So these are common sites, things that it definitely knows, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, stuff like that, and uh, 484 total resources. This might be other things that look like usernames and passwords, session cookies, stuff like that. And what you can also do here is generate fingerprints. Again, I'm, I'm saying fingerprint, but now we're starting to blur the line as to what a fingerprint actually is. Uh, what this is doing, and I can't show every step because there are some details that I don't want anyone to, or anyone who owns this site to query in order to find out whose account this is, because we still want this account. Um, but you go through and you can select which aspects of the environment on the victim's computer you want to emulate. So it can be the browser data, it can be the operating system, it can be qualities of the operating system, the storage space, things like that. And then once you have uh, gathered all the information that you want, you uh, can generate your fingerprint, the extension communicates with the marketplace, and now your browser has all the data of that victim's computer. So this will easily bypass a lot of risk uh, scores for modern authentication. Things like where you log in from a new Wi-Fi point or, or device or something like that. You're like, hey, this is new. Can you enter your multi-factor authentication token? Something like that. Uh, this is designed to make you look like your victim. Uh, and of course, as with a lot of uh, malicious software that is built and generated by Russia, it abides by the don't screw your buddies policy. Um, so none of the uh, CIS uh, countries uh, are, are part of this uh, circle. So if you're looking to exploit any uh, Russian accounts or services, you're out of luck, unfortunately. So what we're seeing here in general um, is the trend towards advanced malware that is learning and emulating everything about a host device. So as we were talking about earlier, the trend is looking for how to emulate actual humans. What we're seeing uh, and what we see with the trends of uh, malware is that a lot of it starts with ad fraud because there's just so much money and so much fraud already in ad, ad networks. Um, and then we see moving on to crypto mining because that's a, that was an easier way to, to grab money or steal money. Uh, and now it's just general account takeover is boring stuff now, but irrelevant for me. Um, and this is a, this is a great article that was written on BuzzFeed, I think, uh, mid to late last year, uh, which is a bunch of malicious applications on mobile devices learning how the applications and user were using those devices in order to commit ad fraud. So the learning of individual user behavior already has precedent and is already falling in line with what we would expect. And then you combine that with account takeovers, uh, malware that is already resident on individuals' machines, and it becomes easier to see how you can bypass even those super Super, super cool vendors that are talking about AI behavior analysis that'll identify your user behavior in order to identify you. It's like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. Um, so that is where we see things going. Um, and at that point, it's going to be extremely difficult to identify uh, all of these uh, individual malicious attackers. So the one thing I can leave you with, uh, this is a fraud problem. And fraud problems are not technical problems. We can't find a silver bullet solution against humans. Because if you are financially motivated and you can justify economically your actions and you have to put food on the table for your family and pay rent, you're going to figure out a way to attack the people you want to attack if that is your particular career choice. 
So advanced credential stuffing and stuff like that is, is very sophisticated fraud. It's not a bot problem or anything like that. You can't just smack it down and walk away. These are things that you're going to have to start building teams around. You have to take back to your executives, your managers, your vice presidents, and, and talk about the problem because it's going to involve a change in the way we organize as companies. Developers is going to have to be, become closer to security and fraud teams. You have to do better at understanding each other so we can build features earlier in the pipeline to address problems because this is the attackers iterate very, very quickly. Uh, even if we're super agile working in one or two week sprints, it's not fast enough to get things out. Uh, so imitation attacks in general, uh, they're designed to blend in. And unfortunately, that makes it difficult for you to just walk over to your graphs or your ops teams or, or whatever else and just see whether or not you have a, a bunch of fraud uh, because they're designed to blend in. They're designed to look like legitimate users. So you're going to have to look deeper in order to figure out whether or not you actually do have a problem. Uh, and in general, at the end, I mean, every single defense you put in place is going to fail. That is something that, that uh, we, we just have to understand. I work for a company who specifically like tries to build stuff to defend against this. Our defenses fail all the time. It's how you adapt to that failure that is important. And that is something that our teams, security teams and development teams, need to adopt because that is a different level of iteration and agility. Uh, thank you. That is uh, my talk. I'm Jared Overson. You can find me at JS Overson just about everywhere. Uh, I do have an NFC chip implant. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can tap my hand with your phone, uh, which is creepy and, and cool at the same time. Uh, thank you. Yeah.